I'm astonished how many reading groups there are. Did you know? All over Italia, all over Espania, all over Inglaterra. So many reading groups. It's fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the English experience. Uh, in England, as I think in many countries, private groups, groups uh, which are friendship-based, have met for many, many decades, maybe 100 years. But libraries, this was not part of their work. They didn't see their role as to start and run reading groups. And I think the first one, um, as far as I know, was one I set up in 1994 in the north of England. And from there, a bit like the story being told across Europe, it has just exploded. The key things which made a difference in the UK, we had a national year of reading in 1998, and that made a very big difference. It was a political initiative designed to help reading in schools, and the schools did nothing, and the libraries did everything. And that actually did the libraries a lot of good. Uh, we also had some very big training programs. Uh, my company runs training for library staff in promoting reading. And we ran a program called Branching Out for three years in England. We had 33 librarians and they came together every six weeks and they did tasks in between, all about promoting reading. And they were all asked to become agents of change in their own service. And one of the things they had to do, all of them set up reading groups. That was then repeated in a three-year program in Wales and a two-year program in Scotland. And that set the bones of, I think, what then happened. We also had very good connections with publishers and booksellers. And in uh, the year 2000, we had a project with Waterstones, the biggest UK bookseller. Some of you may know them. Uh, we created a reading group toolbox a hundred ideas in one box, uh, all you ever needed to know to start a reading group. Because what we found was everybody wanted to belong to a reading group, and nobody in England wanted to be the moderator, the boss, the facilitator, the organizer. <laughs> they just wanted to come. <laughs> so we had to find a way to spread the responsibility. Now we have a lot of organizations involved in reading groups. Uh, two of the biggest in the UK now, one is called the Reading Agency. They do a lot of work, especially with children. They have a very successful program called Chatterbooks for young children. And in the last five years, growing again from just one person, an organization called The Reader, they have a program called Get Into Reading, which is all about reading out loud, particularly with uh, vulnerable and uh, lonely and depressed people. You don't have to declare yourself to be that, to go, but... Uh, so we think from one, we have the last estimate, around 10,000 groups running out of public libraries. That's phenomenal as a social movement in such a short space of time. And I am hearing it's just the same in Spain. So it's fascinating. Here's an example. Uh, if you want to check the websites afterwards, you can see the uh, reading agency website. This is find a reading group near you, and you can put in your address. This is local to me. And it brings up all the reading groups in the area. So these are all open reading groups you can go and join. Uh, this uh, reading agency also makes very good connections nationally with publishers. It's quite hard for a small library service to make that connection to get um, uh, free books, uh, to get maybe a writer visit. We've done very well with asking publishers not for the big names, not for the bestsellers, who is the writer, the new writer? Who is the writer on their second book? Who is the writer whose reputation we need to build? This is where reading groups and libraries can help. 
Here you can see they're not only uh, offering free books, but the top one is proof copies. You can get a copy of the book before it is published. Because for the publisher, if the reading group starts saying it's a great book, that's the best publicity they could ever get. And uh, here is the other one, the reader.org.uk. If you ever need evidence of how reading groups contribute to society, this is a very good site to look at. Uh, evaluation reports. Put in the word evaluation. There's lots of research. I will give you just one here from the bottom. This is from somebody in the health service in the UK, the Mersey Care National Health Service Trust. I can identify people within Get Into Reading at Mersey Care NHS Trust who otherwise would have needed inpatient care had it not been for the support and benefit of the groups. Groups cost about six pounds per person, easy to translate to euros, per session. By comparison, an inpatient stay, that's being in hospital, costs an average 9,000 pounds. The public library saves every country millions in healthcare. Absolutely millions. Depression is the single largest health issue in Western Europe. Depression is bigger than cancer in the UK. And who is helping to deal with it? The public library. Just one example, this is another one quite local to me, uh, not a very heavily populated area. They offer books to borrow to private groups and to books based in the library. And they have 200 groups uh, borrowing books. Just some examples. One is a listening group. They listen on um, audio because they all have sight problems. Another one is a drop-in group. You can just come any time. You don't need to prepare or read anything in advance. Another one is a university of the third age, the elderly, as we were talking about. Another one based in a hospital in the mental health unit. A group that wants to read only classics. That's their decision. That's, you join that one to read classics. They have a library staff reading group and several women's institutes groups in rural areas. We have lots of that kind of group too. So there's a big diversity. I think that's something everybody else has said. Uh, there's no one model for reading groups to be the same. Let them be what they want to be. I'm going to talk especially about the reading groups in libraries in the UK, and for us, library starting reading groups was part of a much bigger movement called the Reader Development Movement, which was about raising the status of reading and changing the role of the public library in the literature world. These are the aims of this movement to increase people's enjoyment and confidence in reading, to open up reading choices. Because so many of us, we read the names we know, we read the things we're comfortable with, reading groups, always read aspirationally. They're all, of course, we all read bestsellers. We all read easy reads, genre reads. But the reading groups don't need to discuss those. They want to discuss the one which is just a bit more pushing, a bit more challenging, something which is harder. Fantastic. We also seek to offer opportunities to share reading experiences and to raise the status of reading as a creative activity. I think reading is a little better status-wise than it was when I began in this work, but you still find a lot of prejudice. How many parents say to their children, get your head out of a book, go and get some fresh air? That's very common in England. Um, how many people think of the writer as a romantic, creative, passionate soul, even if they're isolated, whereas the reader, particularly if she's female and reading romance, clearly has no sex life at all? That's the prejudice, even with Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> so, you know, we have to deal with those things. This is part of a bigger movement in public libraries in the UK to change the service from sitting behind the desk, stamping the books, to coming out to engage with the readers. I think that's the same also from what I've been listening to in Spain as well. So the reading groups were part of many, many activities to do this. 
And the government was very supportive, and by 2004, uh, every library service was required to have a reader development strategy. They're no longer required to have it, sadly, but they did have to have it for about six years, and I think it's changed things. So this is what I talk about, the reader-centered approach. And this is where reading groups are wonderful. You start from the reading experience and not from the text. You start from what you think and feel, what, how the book connected to you. You keep it different, in our case, from study. We have a whole lot of places you can go to study literature. They're excellent. If you want to study, pass an exam, get a qualification, excellent. But if you don't want to do that, we need an alternative. And libraries shouldn't try to compete with the educational institutions. Because this is the great leveler in a reading group. Each participant is expert in their own reading experience. You may know more than me about the author. You may know more than me about the background. You may know more than me about the setting. You don't know more than me about what I feel. That is a tremendously empowering experience. And it's also what enables groups of very different educational backgrounds or preferences or reading appetites. Some people read one book every six months. Some people read a book every two days. <laughs> it enables them to meet together equally. That's very important. Some examples of how we make this work. I can't give you lots because we don't have the time, but I just, somebody will ask me, what do you mean, the reader-centered approach? Okay, we use these ideas every first session and we use this kind of idea in the middle of a session. So you don't all arrive just to discuss one book. These are classic questions you can use over and over again. Where do you read? What places do you read in? That will reveal an awful lot about people's lives. <clears throat> do they read in bed? Do they read in the bath? Do they read commuting? Do they read on the toilet? There's all kinds of things that come out. Quite a different one. What do you read when you're ill? Children, anybody parent will know, children always read something younger than their age when they're ill. What's the equivalent for an adult? I had a friend when the Agatha Christie's came out, you knew she'd got flu. You know, she never read them otherwise, but out came these old Agatha Christie's because phew, it's all she could cope with. Very easy to do exercises around book covers. Stand up 10 books and have a discussion which ones appeal to you and which don't. It's a very easy exercise. Different books each time, fascinating. Another one, if you're in a library, or you could do this online, but it's easier in a physical library, we ask people, choose a treat, a book that would be a real treat for you. Choose a challenge, a book which is a stretch for you, but you want to read it. And choose a book you wouldn't read ever even if somebody paid you to. Okay. And you bring the three books back and you discuss who has chosen what. And nearly always, the book that somebody says, I would never read this even if you paid me, turns out to be somebody else's treat. Because different reading preferences vary so much. And that establishes a way of talking about books which is not judgmental, very important. You never put anybody else down for what they read. Another nice one, which character in a book did you first fall in love with? We give lots of examples of things to share the responsibility. So this is uh, the little drinks mat you put underneath your cup so you don't mark the table. And we provide them little cardboard ones or paper, print them out. And you turn them over, and each person has something they must do. Very important, please bring the wine. Please ask a question you don't know the answer to. Now, if you're clever, you can manipulate these. So you have one of those people in your group who is Mr. or Mrs. Know-it-all. And they constantly ask questions so they can give a lecture about how much they know, you make sure they have this one, okay? 
Or even the other one, please put your energy into helping others make their points rather than making your own. These are just little games which help to make it go very easily. One we use a lot when we do read the same book is bookmarks. You give people four bookmarks and you ask them when they're reading the book to put the book, the bookmark, into the book at the point, the first one, at the end of the first chunk that they read. Take stock and you write a little bit about what you're thinking about the book now. Now, for some people, that might be two pages. For other people, it might be half the book. It's really interesting. If you all choose the same page, you need to tell the author because you found out something. <laughs> then put the next one in at the point where you get into the book and knew you would continue to read it. Then put the next one in where your involvement with the book went down a bit. And the last one on the last page you read, which may be the last page, but may not be the last page. And you all arrive with four bookmarks in the book. You don't need a moderator. You have an instant discussion. It's a different way to start the conversation, and you don't need any other background knowledge. These things work really, really well. This is um, a more a recent um, website one. I don't know if Wordle is available in Italian and Spanish, but put it into Google and try it. It's a way to make a visual diagram out of words. And you just make a list of words, and if you say um, uh, uh, repetition, if you put the word funny in more times, then it will come up uh, big. So this is a Wordle for the response of the reading group I belong to, uh, which met last week to discuss this book by an American writer. And we made this wordle from all the things that were said. Uh, about 90% of the group were very positive, and you can see one of them hated it. So we have all this wonderful cinematic Cohen Brothers, funny, moral, violent, and then we have somebody tedious, pointless. That's always happening. We also look to use what reading groups do to give back to the library. So get the reading group recommending things in the library. Other people will pick up books that the reading groups say are worth reading. We have a nice image here, the dandelion seed, it, uh, and those seeds go all through the audience. We put that into little book stands with one book, give it a highlight, somebody will take that, then you put another one in, we use the things that readers say, sometimes big in the library. Here, this is a small local library. This guy has used the library all his life and everybody knows him. And look what he says, books bring me here. I come for escapism, pure and simple. Not a man that most people would think had a significant escapist life, but you know, he does, fantastic. We also put these into uh, little stands we make to turn books face forward. These are children's ones. These are all real things that children have said. These are teenagers. It's a great one there. That book upset me so much. It was brilliant. <laughs> exactly the words that a teenager would say. And adult ones. Uh, this was said to some, I, I, this was in a group I was in very early on. When you've been married 32 years, it gets a bit monotonous. I'd sooner read about it. <laughs> She's not Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Sometimes you can use the comments. This is, um, this is uh, the uh, local, the municipality calendar. You know, often they do a calendar every year. Usually in the UK, it has lovely old photographs of our chita, you know, our town. Doesn't it look beautiful? This year, this is Durham. Somebody spoke to me about Durham. They did readers. Each page had a different reader on, and each reader chose a book. And you can see they included the very small baby who has any book I can suck. But you can use the comments that readers give you in that way. And sometimes you can have a big party. This is one of the... Uh, great events, I think, that works for lots of reading groups. And I will just take a few minutes to give you the background, because um, 
I think you have to understand this one, particularly for the English. Uh, I'm talking to Italians and Spanish. You have wonderful wine cultures. Uh, English wine, mm, it's beginning to global warming, you know. We have a little bit of English wine on the southern coast. <laughs> but this is a reading group event organized in my local reading, uh, my local library. This is a part of England, the north of England. It's industrial. It used to be uh, mining, yeah? So it's not a place of great culture. What's the thing the English are really, really bad at in terms of reading? Anything that is not in English. You all know this. The English are the laziest because of accidents of history. They are allowed to be. But also, they are um, uncomfortable. They're an island. If I can't pronounce the name, how can I ever read the book? So we wanted to encourage people in my small town, Pontefract, to read books from other languages. So the reading group was going to put on an event to encourage this. What did they do? Well, they created a wine and book tasting. So it was an evening in the library, and we had four wines, and we had eight books, and we got the wines from the local supermarket, Tesco. They could put an offer on, so they gave us them free. They sent a man to tell us about the wine, and everybody sat and listened to the wine from Italy, the wine from Spain, a description. They had to then taste it, think about it, and then they heard a reading from the book. The book was connected to the wine, and the books were all borrowed. The uh, manager of Tesco's joined the library. Hadn't happened before. Um, it sold out the event. We did make people pay a little bit for it. Not very much. Um, and I want to see, show you here. This is the uh, book list that was made from that event, which was called Perfect Partners. Welcome to a wine and book tasting produced by Pontefract Library Readers Group. What could be better than unwinding with a good book and a glass of wine? Why not match the length and finish of a good Rioja with the sophistication of a Spanish detective story? Or enjoy the delights of a best-selling Italian white, uh, sorry, best-selling Italian novel with a lightly aromatic, smooth Italian white. And you could have a lot of fun using wine language to write about books. This is an event that's been repeated in many different places. Uh, I've run it in Moravia with Bohemian wines. It's been run in New Zealand with New Zealand wines. And this had no authors at it. You can make a great event just from the readers and the reading experiences. The issue, I think, in England on reading groups is the sustainability and the independence. We've not mostly had paid moderators, except in some instances where there's been a special project or um, in a health context. Often the library staff or volunteers are doing it in their own time. But how do you keep it going? And some senior library managers say, that reading group's all very well, but it's 20 people, and we have 5,000 people use this library every week. You are spending too much time on 20. So this is what we answer. The first one, this is very important, reading groups are organic. They have a natural life cycle. So don't struggle to keep a dying one alive. Let it die, okay? They will just go up and down, and everybody feels guilty. Oh, that reading group isn't as good as it used to be. Cut its throat. Gone. And start another one somewhere else and get that going, okay? The other thing is supporting reading groups to be more independent so they don't need a lot of library resources or time. What they need is the space. They need the access to make a hot drink. Um, they need the books, and we also have partnerships to make the books possible across a lot of areas. And many uh, library services now in the UK have developed a policy on reading groups. So they say, this is what you'll get, these are our priorities, and that helps, I think. But there are real benefits to the library. Staff develop skills and confidence in talking about books. The ones who have been involved in reading groups are so much better at every other aspect of their job. 
it is the best training in the world. Readers can give back. Advocacy. The readers can speak up for you with the politicians. I've already shown you comments and reviews, notice boards, events. My local readers group went to the school and did events in the school. It was the readers group that did it, and not the library staff. They provide a ready-made audience for author events whenever you do want to bring an author, and they make a major contribution to community cohesion. I'll come back to that. Why people love reading groups? I'm nearly done, I promise. Just five more, less than five. What is it about reading groups that makes them so good? I think it's because it gives a safe way to discuss deep issues and emotions. People hunger for depth and meaning in their lives. But if you talk about your own emotions, that's a confession. Okay? Now, you might confess to your best friend, you might confess to your priest, but many of us don't want to confess to the whole reading group. Uh, the American model of reading groups is based on confession. The 12-step model, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, everything they do is based on that model, so far as I can see. Uh, that doesn't work in England. The English will not open up in public. They're much more reserved. I think Italians, although... Oh, Bella Fagura, I think actually inside Italians are quite reserved too. So when you discuss the characters in a book, you don't have to reveal your own position. You are in control of that. Let's take a very simple example. A character in a book has cancer. In any group, there's probably at least one person with cancer. They have the choice whether to say they have cancer or not, okay? Maybe there's somebody else with a relative who has cancer. Maybe there's somebody else who has already had a member of their family die from cancer. If they want to start talking about that, they can. If they don't want to, they don't have to, okay? Apart from confession, when do we talk deep issues, politics, religion? Ah, we get angry, yes? Um, or we fight. These are the things that people care passionately about, and public discussions will very quickly take very firm positions of opposition one to another. When you discuss whether Anna Karenina did the right thing or not, nobody knows if you have committed adultery, unless you want to tell them, okay? It's, it means you can go very deep without actually saying anything, you, you know, you probably know the librarian is having an affair at the moment, but you don't say that either, <laughs> unless she does. <laughs> so it's a fantastic <laughs> possibility, I think. This next comment, this was said to me by somebody aged about 75 in London who had discovered reading groups when she was about 70, and she said the reading group is the only place in a long life where I have experienced amicable disagreement, friendly disagreement. She said, I've had a lot of arguments in my life and a lot of friendships, but I have never found a place to have friendly disagreement. It's a great description of a reading group. I think the mix of intellectual challenge, emotional depth, and social networking is hard to find anywhere else. Why that matters? and this I think is important for the politicians too, respect for different opinions. What you like, what I like, what you think, what I think, it's the basis of any reading group. And that is the cornerstone of any participatory democracy. Reading lets you walk in someone else's shoes. And talking about that walk adds another level. Library-based groups are open and include many people who are otherwise isolated. I think there's room for private closed groups and public groups, they both work. But the library one, if it's in the public library, it's open to anybody. It will be more diverse. Libraries are full of mad people. And they will go to the reading group. <laughs> this is a great thing about libraries. <laughs> and reading groups help 
they help the wider book world. Publishers and booksellers know word of mouth lifts sales. So the reading group movement helps the whole, the whole literary culture, in my view. If you're interested in this approach, uh, opening the book, my company is looking for partners to make an application to the EU Cultural Fund because the new focus of the EU cultural funds from 2014 is on audience development. And we want to bring librarians in different countries together to develop reader-centered skills to promote literature in new ways. So please speak to me about that if you're interested. In the audience, I know we have some uh, Patrizia Lucini who's thinking of translating the book we wrote about this. So it may be possible to have that in Italian too. But thank you very much for listening.